the five predicables. Loosely basing himself on Aristotle's book, The Topics, the third century Neoplatonist Porphyry wrote a book called the Isagoge, in which he distinguished five kinds of universals. These are, were later called the five predicables. They are a key tool in any science for defining and classifying the things studied by that science. No matter what you are studying, from biology to chemistry to geometry to accounting to marketing, you should know the five predicables better than the back of your hand, and be prepared to classify what you are studying according to these five predicables. In this lecture, we will look at what the predicables are and give examples of how they are used in classification within diverse sciences. Every simple proposition is composed of two parts a subject and a predicate. The subject is that about which something is stated. We either affirm something of something or we negate something of something. So the subject is that about which we are affirming or negating. The predicate, however, is that which is being affirmed or negated. It's what is stated about the subject. For instance, in the sentence, Socrates is wise, or squirrels are furry, the subject is Socrates, or squirrels, and the predicate is wise, or furry. Joining the subject in the predicate is some form of the verb to be. For instance, is, am, or are. This is called the copula of the sentence because it copulates, that is, brings together, the predicate and the subject. Now, some simple sentences do not explicitly include a form of the verb to be, but only do so implicitly. For instance, Socrates sits, or squirrels eat. According to traditional logic, these sentences can be converted into sentences explicitly including a verb of being. For instance, Socrates is sitting, or squirrels are eating. Notice that there's a verb of being now in these sentences after we've converted the verb sits into the copula plus participle is sitting, or the verb eat into the copula plus participle are eating. With negative sentences, that is, negations, we find implicitly or explicitly not only a subject, a predicate, and a verb of being or copula, but also a negative particle, such as not or no. For instance, in the sentence, Socrates is not sitting, we have the subject Socrates, the copula is, then the negative particle, and then the predicate sitting. Likewise, in the sentence, squirrels are not carnivorous, we have the subject squirrels, the copula are, the negative particle not, and the predicate carnivorous. Besides subject, predicate, copula, and negative particle, there are three other things you will want to pay attention to in simple sentences. First of all, there are quantifying particles. These are also called quantifiers. These are words like every, some, a, or an, no, not any, etc. These indicate the way in which we are to take a particular modified word. For instance, if I say every squirrel is furry, that indicates that the predicate furry belongs to everything falling under the concept of squirrel. Likewise, if I say no squirrel is furry, that indicates that furry does not belong to anything falling under the concept squirrel. So every and no are both quantifiers. They tell us the quantity with which we are to take the word that they're modifying. If I say a squirrel is furry or some squirrel is furry, that indicates that furry 
need only belong to at least one individual matching the concept of squirrel. It need not belong to every individual matching that concept. Likewise, there's obviously a great difference between saying Socrates is a human and Socrates is every human. The first of these sentences is true, but the second is false, even though the subject and the predicate signify the same concept in both cases. Here the quantifier is modifying the predicate. In the previous examples, the quantifier had been modifying the subject. So pay attention to quantifiers. They can affect whether a sentence is true or false. Secondly, you'll also want to pay attention to the parts of a predicate. Sometimes predicates signify just one concept. This happens when the predicate is nothing but a verb, participle, noun, or adjective. For instance, Socrates sings. Here, the predicate is just a verb. Or, Socrates is singing. Here, the predicate is just a participle. Or, Socrates is a man. Here, the predicate is just a noun. Or, Socrates is clever. Here, the predicate is just an adjective. In other cases, the predicate includes an object. This can be either a direct object or an indirect object. An object is the recipient of the action signified by the verb or participle in the predicate. For instance, if I say, Achilles stabs Hector, or Socrates is stabbing Hector, Hector is the direct object because he receives the action of being stabbed. Likewise, if I say Socrates speaks to the jury, the jury is the indirect object since it is what receives his action of speaking. A direct object is something that receives an action primarily, but an indirect object is one that receives an action secondarily, or in a mediated way. For instance, if I say Washington is mailing ammunition to Jefferson, the direct object is the ammunition, since that is what is being primarily affected by the act of mailing. Jefferson himself isn't being mailed, but ammunition is. Nevertheless, Jefferson is also affected by the action indirectly inasmuch as he receives what is being mailed. He receives the ammunition. So the ammunition is the direct object and Jefferson is the indirect object. For the sake of exercises in logic, always include the object and the quantifiers or other words that modify an object within the predicate. Treat the whole phrase, which would include the verb slash participle slash noun slash adjective, and the objects as if they are a single predicate. Notice that I have followed this advice above by making the whole predicate phrase, including the verb, participle, noun, adjective, plus object, as one color, namely green. A final note concerning the structure of simple propositions is that there are often miscellaneous words that modify either the subject or the predicate or the copula. For instance, if I say that rational animals are living, the word rational is an adjective modifying the word animals. Since it modifies the subject term, I simply include it within the subject for the purposes of the logic we'll be doing in this class. Likewise, if I say Socrates is running quickly, quickly modifies the participle running, so I include the adverb as part of the predicate. Some words or phrases can be grouped with the copula because that is what they are modifying. These are often temporal adverbs such as always or sometimes, or words connoting possibility or necessity, such as can, necessarily, possibly, or must. Again, just view these words as part of the copula itself. For instance, Germans are always efficient. The subject is Germans, the predicate efficient. But the way in which efficient is predicated of Germans is not just sometimes, but always. So always is modifying the connection between the subject and the predicate. It's modifying the copula. Likewise, when I say seeing aliens is sometimes shocking, the subject is seeing aliens, that whole action, and then the predicate is shocking. 
Now, the word sometimes is modifying the way in which the predicate belongs to the subject. It's not the case that I'm saying that shocking always belongs to the subject, that is, the action of seeing aliens. Rather, I'm saying it sometimes belongs to the subject. Here's another example. Death is necessarily preceded by life. The predicate here is preceded by life, and the subject is death necessarily is saying that the predicate necessarily belongs to the subject. So it's modifying the way in which the predicate belongs to the subject, so it's modifying the copula. Likewise, in the sentences, mammals are possibly carnivorous, animals can be dangerous, and alligators must be dangerous. In all of these sentences, the words must, can, possibly, are all modifying the copula. So we'll just include them within the copula phrase. In other videos, I discuss the ways in which to classify these various classifications of, or modifications of the copula. Despite all of this complication, the basic structure of a simple proposition is quite easy to understand. Subject, copula, and predicate. The subject is what you are talking about. The predicate is what you are saying about that subject. And the copula, or the copula plus negative particle, are what relate the predicate to the subject as either joined to it, as in an affirmative proposition, or separated from it, as in a negative proposition or negation. For instance, when I say Socrates is wise, is establishes the relationship between the predicate and the subject such that the predicate is joined to the subject. Wise is joined to Socrates. But when I say Socrates is not wise, is not establishes the relationship between the predicate and the subject such that the predicate is separated from the subject. So is or is not is what establishes the relationship between the predicate and the subject. From all of this, it is easy to see what a predicable is. Speaking broadly, a predicable is just a word that can be predicated. It is able to be predicated via a form of the verb is. So it is called a predicable, that is, predict-able. This is the broad or loose meaning of predicable. It's not the strict meaning. More strictly, however, a predicable is not whatever can be predicated at all, but instead, whatever can be predicated of many things. Thus, what is able to be predicated of one thing is not a predicable in the strict sense, even though it is able to be predicated. For instance, when I say Superman is Clark Kent, or Strider is Aragorn, the predicates Clark Kent and Aragorn are predicable, broadly speaking, since they are, after all, being predicated, and thus must be able to be predicated. Nevertheless, these words are proper names, and therefore are only able to be predicated of one single thing, a particular individual, Strider or Superman. Thus, these predicates are not predicables in the strict sense. Predicables in the strict sense, or taking the word properly, are things capable of being predicated of more than one thing. They signify something universal or common. The words universal and common mean the same thing as we use them in this course. Take the following sentences. Clark Kent is a superhero. Aragorn is a king. Socrates is a human. Sting is a sword. In each case, the predicate is a predicable because it signifies a universal, that is, something common to many individuals. King can be said of Aragorn, or of Louis, or of Arthur, or of Henry. All of these people, all of these individuals, are kings, and so the notion signified by king is common to all of them. Therefore, since it's a common notion, it's called a universal. Thus, the word signifying this notion 
is a predicable because it can be predicated of multiple individuals. Likewise, sword signifies a universal. Thus, the word sword is a predicable in the strict sense because it could be predicated of multiple individuals. It can be predicated of Sting, of Excalibur, or of Glamdring, each of which is a distinct individual sword. They're not just different names for the same individual sword, they're really different individual swords. And since sword can be predicated of each of these distinct individuals, it follows that sword is a predicable in the strict sense. That is, it signifies a universal notion. For the sake of this video, we will draw no strict distinction between the concept of a universal and that of a predicable. Both can be defined, strictly speaking, as what can be predicated of more than one thing. Sword is a universal, or a predicable, because it can be predicated of more than one individual. Likewise, king can be predicated of more than one individual, and therefore it's a universal, or a predicable, in the strict sense. As we saw in the last slide, a predicable, also called a universal, is what can be predicated of more than one thing. Now, what's opposed to a predicable or universal is an individual or singular. For the purposes of this class, the words individual and singular will be treated interchangeably. An individual or singular is something that can be predicated of only one thing. That is, not of multiple things, but only of one. For example, Aragorn is a singular because it can only be predicated of that one individual, even though that individual might have multiple names. In contrast, human is a universal because it can be predicated of multiple individuals, of Aragorn, Plato, and Socrates. All of these individuals fall under the concept signified by human, but only one individual falls under the concept signified by Aragorn. And so Aragorn is a singular, but human is a universal. Now, if we leave aside individuals or singulars and just focus on classifying universals or predicables, we find that there are five kinds of universals or predicables. These five predicables or universals, which were classified by Porphyry, are the following. One, genus. Two, species. Three, difference four property, and five accident. On the next slide, we'll explain what each of these is. For now, let's say something about a few of the names. Now, students often wonder how to make the word genus into a plural. So the plural of genus is not genuses, but genera. So when you see the word genera, that's just the plural form of the word genus. Now the word species has for its plural form just species. Now let's look at the word difference. Now there are multiple ways of naming this predicable. Sometimes instead of being called a difference, it's called a specific difference. Those two phrases just mean the same thing. Likewise, sometimes it's left in Latin and treated as an English word. So sometimes it's called the differentia that is D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-T-I-A. Now, that means the same thing as difference, it's just the Latin word for difference. And often, even in English works, it's just left in Latin. The plural of differentia is differentiae, D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-T-I-A-E. -E. So, if you see the word differentia, specific difference, or difference, all of those things mean the same thing. Now it gets a little more tricky when we look at property and accident. The property is sometimes called a proper accident. So in some sense, accident, the term accident can include both property and accident. But if you just see accident, um, Judge based on context whether we're talking about something specifically contrasted with property or something that's broad enough to include either a property or a non-proper accident. So the words property and proper accident mean the same thing. 
Accident can also be called a non-proper accident in order to contrast one kind of accident with another, namely the proper and the non-proper. So that's enough about the names of the five universals or predicals. Now let's look at what these actually are. As we saw in the last slide, there are five kinds of universals or predicables. Let's look at what these are. The genus is defined as the predicate signifying what a thing is which is predicable of multiple things differing in species. So a genus has to have under it multiple species as well as multiple individuals. For instance, animal is a genus because it is predicable of man, horse, and ox, and those are different species. Now, a species can be taken either properly or loosely. Properly speaking, it is a predicate signifying what a thing is, which is predicable of multiple things that differ only in number or by accident, but not in what they essentially are. On the other hand, Sometimes more loosely, we'll speak of a species as any predicate signifying what a thing is, which is predicable of multiple things that differ in number or by accident, regardless of whether that is the only way in which those things differ. They might also differ essentially. Here's an example of the proper sense of species. Human or man is a species, properly speaking, because it is predicable of both Socrates and Plato, who themselves differ only by accident, or a number, not in what they essentially are. They don't differ in species. Now, a specific difference, or differentia, or difference, is a predicate signifying that aspect of what a thing is by which its species is divided from other species within the same genus. For instance, rational is a difference because it is that by which the human animal differs from irrational animal species, like ox and horse. What differentiates humans from oxes and, and horses is that they are rational. So rational is the difference, or specific difference, that constitutes the species human. Another example is triangle. With triangle, the specific difference is three-sided. That's what distinguishes a triangle from other closed plane figures. So for instance, a square, is, like a triangle, is a closed plane figure. That's a genus that it has in common with a triangle. But what distinguishes a triangle from a square is that it's three-sided. So the specific difference, or differentia, by which a triangle is set apart from a square is that it's three-sided. Now let's look at proper accident, or property. Again, remember, property and proper accident mean the exact same thing. The property, or proper accident, is a predicate not signifying what a thing is, but which is common to all members of a certain species, but not found outside of the species. For instance, risible, which is the ability to laugh, belongs to all humans, but doesn't belong to things which aren't humans. So it's a property of humans. It doesn't signify what humans are, essentially, but it signifies something that belongs to all humans and to nothing besides humans. So it's a property of humans. Here's another example. The ability to bark is a property of dogs. Likewise, we might say that the uh, ability to neigh is a property of horses. Now let's look at the last of the five predicables, namely the non-proper accident which sometimes is just called the accident. This is a predicate that, like the property, does not signify what a thing is, but unlike the property, it can be present or absent to the subject without any contradiction. Now, there are two kinds of accident. There's the separable accident, and this is an accident 
that the subjects can be without. For instance, white and black are separable accidents for humans since humans, some humans are white and some are not. And on the other hand, there's the inseparable accident. The inseparable accident is an accident that the subject cannot be without. For instance, white is an inseparable accident for swans, since every swan is white. Likewise, black is an inseparable accident for ravens, since all ravens are black. Certain personality traits are inseparable inseparable accidents, not for a whole species, but for individual humans, or for individual dogs or horses. So, although accidents are accidents in this logical sense, that doesn't mean accidents can't be important. Now, all five of these, the genus, the species, the specific difference, the proper accident, and the non-proper accident, all five of them are universals. The first three of them, the genus, the species, and the specific difference, are all essential or substantial predicates. That is, all of them have in common that they signify what a thing is. They tell you the essence or substance of a thing they get to what's fundamental in it. On the other hand, proper accidents or properties and non-proper accidents or just accidents, these are not essential. They're rather accidental predicates. They tell you what belongs to a thing, but they don't tell you what's fundamental in it. They don't tell you its essence. They don't tell you what it is. Now let's talk about the different ways of using the predicables. Now that we've defined them, let's put them to use. The best way to see how to use the predicables is to start by the question of how do you define something. Specifically, we'll start by looking at how not to define something. Suppose you are asked to define justice. Someone asks you, what is justice? Here are two bad ways you could reply to that question. First, you might say justice is punishing wrongdoing, or justice is Socrates, the most just man. In both of these cases, you have merely given an example of a just action or a just person, but you haven't clarified what justice itself is. Examples are not the same thing as definitions. If I ask you what an animal is, you can't just say an ox or a horse. That doesn't tell me what animal itself is, it only gives me an example of an animal. Second, you might say justice is righteousness. This is also a bad definition. Although this does tell you what justice is, it doesn't explain anything. You've merely given a synonym for justice, because righteousness and justice are just synonyms. They mean the same thing. You haven't unpacked the concept of justice into its conceptual parts, but merely represented it under the guise of another word. When you are asked for a definition, do not just give an example of the thing defined, and do not just give a synonym for the thing defined. Rather, you're going to have to do something more. You're going to have to unpack the conceptual parts of the thing defined. And that's where the predicables come into play. Instead of giving an example or a synonym, definitions should unfold the conceptual content of the thing defined. The two basic conceptual parts in any definition are the genus and the differentia. A good definition will include two predicables, genus and differentia. Together, these two predicables constitute a species. For instance, if we are asked to define a train, we might say it is a railroad vehicle. The genus is vehicle. This is something the train shares in common with sedans, trucks, and SUVs. 
The differentia is railroad. What distinguishes trains from sedans, trucks, and SUVs is that unlike those other locomotive vehicles, a train operates not on a paved road, but on a railroad track. By giving both the genus and the difference, the definition conceptually analyzes the notion of train. It breaks it apart. It unfolds the conceptual content of the thing signified by train so that we can come to a more orderly and explicit understanding of what that word means or what that thing is. Now, there is no reason to stop with just one genus and one differentia in a definition. A highest genus, or summum genus, is a characteristic concerning what a thing is that is so general that there is nothing more general than it. It's impossible to define a highest genus because we can't divide it into something that's a higher genus and a difference. Rather, since it is the highest genus, it's incapable of definition or further explanation. The lowest species, or infima species, is a species that is as specific as possible. No further essential difference can be added to clarify the essence of what is being defined. Between the highest genus and the infima species, however, there are many ways of characterizing what things are in their essence. These intermediate characteristics are called genera, with respect to what is more specific, but species with respect to what is more general. So these intermediate characteristics are both, at the same time, genera and species. Genera with, what, with respect to what is below, that is more specific, and species with respect to what is less specific or more general. For instance, a mammal is an animal with fur. With fur is the difference, and animal is the genus. But more generally, we can say a mammal is a living thing, that is an organism. Although with respect to mammal, animal is a genus, with respect to organism, animal is a species. Likewise, mammal itself is a species with respect to animal, but with respect to dog, cow, and bear, it is a genus, not a species. So all of these intermediary characteristics between the summum genus and the infima species are both genera and species at the same time, but in different respects. When we map this descending hierarchy of essential characteristics, the result is what is called a Porphyrian tree, because it is named after Porphyry who enumerated the five predicables, and because the resulting structure appears something like a branching tree. Let's look at some examples. Let's try to define a human. Now, human is an infima species. There's nothing more specific about a thing that tells you what it is besides human. Now, human falls under the genus animal. What's opposed to human in this genus are beasts, that is, irrational animals. But animal itself is a species falling under the genus organism. What's opposed to animals in the genus organism are non-sentient organisms, that is, non-sentient living things like plants. Now, organism, or living thing, is a species falling under the genus compound body. What's opposed to organisms under this genus are non-living compound bodies, that is, chemical compounds. Now, compound body is itself a species falling under the genus body. What's opposed to the compound body under the genus body is the simple body, which is also called an element. Now, body is itself a species falling under the genus substance. The genus substance is also divided into the other species, namely incorporeal substance, or spirit.
Now, when we get into metaphysics, we'll see that there's further complications when we look at the division of substance. Nevertheless, this gives a general picture of the idea of how a certain general notion can be divided in a series of brackets that are ever more specific until we get to an infima species. It's the job of a scientist in any given field to come up with the correct division so that you fill in all of the gaps between the most general characteristic and the most specific characteristic in stating what a thing is, that is, its essence. Now, notice that all of the rungs on this tree, below the highest genus and above the infima species, are both genera and species at the same time, but in different respects. For instance, compound body is a genus with respect to organism, but it's a species with respect to body. Likewise, body is a genus with respect to compound body, but a species with respect to substance. So all, on all the, the rungs on this ladder, besides the highest genus and the lowest species, the thing that is on that rung is both a genus and a species at the same time, but in different respects. The porphyrian trees can be used not only in biology or in natural science, but in all disciplines and in every field of study. To give an example of this, let's define, define the violin. Let's start this time with something more general rather than with the most specific species. So we can say very generally about a violin that it's an instrument, that is, it's something that's useful. This obviously doesn't tell us very much about a violin, but it is something that says what the violin is, even if in a very general way. Now let's divide this highest genus into more specific species. On the one hand, we have non-man-made instruments, which are called natural instruments. And on the other hand, we have man-made instruments, which are called artificial instruments. Now let's divide artificial instruments into non-musical instruments and musical instruments. We're focusing on artificial instruments because I presume that we all agree that violins are artificial instruments. So artificial tells us something more about what a violin is than just saying it's an instrument. What kind of instrument? Well, it's specifically, it's an artificial instrument. And among artificial instruments, it's not the sort of instrument that a hammer or a chisel is. Rather, it's a musical instrument. So musical instrument tells us even more about what a violin is. But it's not just any musical instrument, it's a specific kind. It's a stringed musical instrument, as opposed to a non-stringed instrument, like uh, an oboe. Now, among stringed instruments, there's still a variety. So it's not like a guitar, which is not played with a bow. Rather, it's a stringed instrument that's played with a bow. Now, there are multiple stringed instruments played with a bow. Violin is the specific one, which is a treble pitched string instrument played with a bow. That's the infima species. That's the definition of violin. This is opposed to non-treble pitched stringed instruments played with a bow, like the cello. Here, notice that everything beneath the highest genus is susceptible of receiving a complete definition that is being divided into genus and difference. Let's take one random rung. Let's just pick out where it says stringed and define that. Here we have a species. A stringed instrument is defined as a musical instrument using strings. The genus is musical instrument, the difference using strings. So every rung underneath the highest genus is capable of being defined. That is, being broken down into genus and difference. Now, the highest genus cannot be defined because it cannot be broken 
into any higher genus with accompanying difference. It is a single generic characteristic that enters into the definitions of everything below, but which itself is incapable of being defined, properly speaking. There are two ways to find a definition. In either case, you start with what is most obvious to you about a thing and proceed from there. In the method of division, what is most obvious about a thing is its most general characteristic. For instance, whatever justice is, we at least know it's a virtue. So we can, def we can find a definition of justice if we start by assuming it is a virtue and then subdividing that general concept of virtue into more and more specific species until we come to a definition that adequately matches our concept of justice. On the other hand, in some cases, what is most obvious about a thing is not its most general characteristic, but rather its similarity with a bunch of individuals in a certain group. In this case, think about what all those individuals have in common, and, the, and then proceed to more and more common characteristics, that is, more and more general characteristics, based on wider and wider groups of individuals, until you come to the highest genus. This is called the method of resemblance. Here's an example. You know that Socrates and Plato are the same kind of thing, so you want to define what that is. So you look for what specifically these two individuals have in common. What do Socrates and Plato have in common? Once you've established that, then you could proceed to wider and wider groups of individuals. What do Socrates, Plato, and this horse have in common? Once you've answered that question, then you could ask, what do Socrates, Plato, this horse, and this tree have in common? Once you've answered that question, you could ask, what do Socrates, Plato, this horse, this tree, and this rock have in common? As you expand the groups of individuals, you come to more and more general characterizations of Socrates and Plato as to what they are. Eventually, you'll reach the highest genus. We've covered several topics in this video. First, dividing simple propositions into subject and predicate. Second, the definition of the five predicables or universals. Third, bad definitions and how to avoid them. Fourth, classifying things into porphyrian trees. And finally, finding good definitions. This material is the bedrock of any scientific investigation. It is presupposed for doing anything systematically in any discipline whatsoever. As such, you should make sure you know the content of this video better than the back of your hand. It should be second nature to you. When you get to that point, you will notice that thinking about a whole host of topics comes much more easily to you. Oh, uh -huh.